Hello and welcome to The Week, the show which takes a look back at the big talking points from across our region over the past seven days with a helping hand from our studio guests. Coming up over the next hour, we'll be reviewing the headlines in the local papers, serving up a few leisure ideas in our Something for the Weekend section and reflecting on the big stories brought to you by our Big Centre TV news team over the last seven days. Remember, this is your show, so if there's an issue you think we should be tackling or a point you want to make, drop us a line through the Big Centre TV website, on Facebook or by email to the week at bigcentre.tv. Now helping me to cast an eye over this week's papers this week, firstly a man whose face is no stranger to Big Centre TV sports viewers, Paul Shuttleworth, and oh. also Matt Dredger from Borrow Club, who also made an appearance on our new show last week, didn't That's you? Right. So you're becoming quite a TV regular as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now Paul, our paths have kind of intertwined over the last they few certainly years. Have. Um, Big Centre TV viewers will know you as the, as the face of ice hockey, won't That's you? That's so, right, so yeah. Um, tell, tell us a bit about that and other I, things you do. I present and commentate on a programme called uh, Rinkside with Red Hockey. Uh, which focuses on the ice hockey that's been played out of Telford. So we look at the Tigers games and sometimes the NA NIHL team, which is the next league down. Uh, we cover and commentate on their games and show them on a highlights programme that first airs on a Wednesday night around 9.30 on Big Centre TV. It's a game I've been passionate about. I used to play as a child, started in 1988 at Silver Blades in Birmingham was pretty rubbish, uh, got an injury and retired, then got into refereeing, so I did about 12 years refereeing for Sky Sports and coaching youth development and kids teams. Mm. So the, the background of mine is that of a referee and a coach. So as a commentator, I'm fairly mm. neutral. Now my co-presenter is Alan Gould, who is an ex-Telford Tigers captain mm. and also the chair of the Supporters Trust that get the Tigers back on the ice when they folded about five, six years ago. Mm. So Alan's got the boardroom side of it and the passion of the players and I kind of explain what the referee's thinking. It's a, it's a tough sport to commentate on though isn't it because from a viewer's point of view you've got to let people know because it's fizzing around yeah. the puck isn't it? Yeah I mean it is the fastest team game in the world and there's a lot of foreign names yeah. which I often get wrong but uh, a player once said to me you say my name that well I think I've been getting it wrong for years <laughs> so I think if you say it with confidence you might be able to get away with it but yeah it certainly is um, high intensity oh, yeah. in terms of what you're talking about and it's one of those games you've got to know the game because without it it's so difficult to follow um, but what you are doing is providing a narrative to help people watch follow it round because of course if you're watching on a smaller television than life size the, the puck's not a very big thing it's about the width of a tennis ball but it's it's not just commentating on the game is it I mean I was watching the highlights from a couple of weeks back was it Telford played Bracknell yeah. and they, they scored a, yeah. a late winner there was a couple of tasty punch-ups in that yeah game, weren't there? and and you do get situations where tempers <coughs> fray and also part of the game is to niggle and upset the better players of the other team because if they start doing something and they get a penalty you, you're getting a good player kicked out of the game for a couple of minutes and that can be a goal scoring opportunity so that control and frustration and job of digging at people's temper is is, is definitely part of the game so Matt, are you much of an ice skater? I used to be, uh, when I was younger, probably about 14 or 15, I used to go down and hop my ice rink. Um, then uh, I didn't go for a while, but then my daughter, who turned 13 only in September, won an ice skating party, so put the boots back on and <laughs> wobbled for a bit, but got back into it, actually. So, yeah, I managed to, uh, to find my feet again, so it uh, was good, actually. I Enjoyed used to it. skate in a perfect square at Silver Blades. I did. I could go in a straight line, but I couldn't turn. <laughs> right. So I had to wait till I hit the side, then I'd turn 90 <laughs> degrees and go the rest of the well, way. Well, my issue is I couldn't stop. Do you <laughs> remember when they had a handrail at Birmingham at Silver Blades? I do. Because when it first started, there yeah. used to be a handrail, because mm. there was no hockey. It was a figuring Silver Blades. Of course, John Curry mm. learned his trade out of there and mm. got on, went on to the Olympics. Yeah. And then in the 80s, when I was there, Wolf O'Reilly trained there. Oh, the who, speed skater. The speed yeah, skater right. who then picked up his gold medals as mm. well. Yeah. So there was a lot of memories, and it was so sad this week because they demolished it's a, it. It's been a milestone week, hasn't yeah. it? So, yeah. I mean, it, it got absolutely demolished, and the people were putting pictures on Facebook of, <coughs> the, of the rubble, and there was one shot of all the, the steel that they put together, and the Zamboni was buried underneath. So you just thought, oh, it's so sad. Because that building opened about 60 years ago now, yeah. the original yeah. Silver Blades, and it was decommissioned um, about a year and a half yeah. ago. 
demolished to make way for uh, apartments in Birmingham. Mm. But there's news this week, of course, that Solly Hall over in Mel Square is getting its first ever outdoor ice skating Excellent. rink. Christ. And they're, uh, they're advertising for staff and people to work there over the Christmas period. And I would imagine that will be a big draw because I know they've had them in the past in Manchester and we've had one in Birmingham, Victoria mm. Square. Mm. So Solly Hall this year is getting its own uh, outdoor ice rink for Christmas shoppers That's opening good. on Friday the 13th of November. Right. Is that a jinx? Day. That doesn't sound great. <laughs> I, need my boots on, actually, yeah. Yeah. I need to check the height of the barriers that I can skate into before <laughs> I have a look at that. To be honest, so uh, but it, I mean it, it's become sort of w w like creating a like winter wonderland in our in our yeah. town centres. Absolutely, one of, yeah. one of the big things. Yeah, the and the one in Birmingham, I've walked past it many a time, and it's really popular, isn't yeah. it? So, mm. and you know, Solio's got their mini version of the German market as well. So this mm. will be a great little draw for, for people uh, as well. And that's one of those things that used to start. I mean, it's the Rockefeller Centre in New York that has the traditional outdoor ring, right. and now it's sort of come over to the UK and it does make those evenings out you know go for a drink at the German market have yourself sort of go for I go ice skating or whatever it does make it a much more social yeah. occasion now rather than the chore of Christmas shopping well that, and that's what town centres need we hear all this talk about yeah. why, why should people go into a town centre when they could go into an out-of-town retail park free parking etc etc yeah you need a unique selling point you don't do, you yeah. and things like this are I'd prices. recommend the skating before the drinking though to yeah be that's probably yeah. about although it might numb the pain yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a good point <laughs> Absolutely. Now, talking of walking past things and commenting upon them, yeah. last week we reported on a new bench that had cropped up in the centre of Wolverhampton that cost nearly £20,000 of taxpayers' money. Right. Materials have been imported from China, and it's fair to say that locals weren't very impressed. Well, this week, spotlight's on Dudley, where a new bench has appeared in the town centre to honour the town's 19th century poet, Ben Boucher. So Big Centre TV took to the streets to find out what shoppers in Dudley made of it all. I think it's absolutely marvellous. It's really nice for the town, I really do. Some people might say, what a waste of money, but it's not, it's beautiful. I think, well, I think Dudley's been ignored for quite a while. And I think it will help to bring people here when they know the way the development's going on. But it also brings, just to look at him, brings back old memories. It's really nice. And do you know much about this poet in particular? I don't know, but I'm going to look it up when I go home. So tell me, what do you think about the statue? It's brilliant, it does. Great. It's a bit of history for the Dudley. And what do you think uh, uh, it will bring to Dudley? Uh, hopefully some more tourism in there. Yeah. And some more interest in there. Do you know who is the person in the statue? No, not at the moment, no, because I already <laughs> So what do you think about this statue? Well, I think it's lovely to bring that to Dudley. It, it, it's a big improvement, but will they make mockery of him? Will they destroy him or will they hang things on him and make a mockery? Other than that, lovely. So I can, I can see the, the, the relevance of that because it's got some kind of local heritage to it. I, I have to say, you know, I'm a Wolverhampton boy and I struggled to see the relevance of a granite yeah. bench in that city that's been imported from China. Yeah, I think what, what stands out for me about looking at that piece was the history involved. You saw the older lady saying it brings back memories. And for younger children, they ask questions, they, they see yeah. the words on the bench, they see the person, they want to know who it is and what the re relevance is to their local history. And that's all there. And yeah. when you've got something like that that's going to be around for generations to come, it triggers a pride in your local history. And that was what was missing for that one last week in Wolverhampton. It was just a concrete bench that yeah. cost an awful lot of money. You always get some kind of difference of opinion whenever there's a pot of money to be spent on something yeah. related to art, don't you? But at least you can justify that. Kind yeah. of. They can say, well, the reason we've done this is because 19th century poet, not many people had heard of him, we were told, we put that right. So yeah. I think. And I always think things like that are really good to tie it back into the local community as well because. There's no point just putting something in there that's just been created without no tie back to the, the local community. So I think that's a real positive. The other thing with something well. like that is as well, you're in a situation where you can sit on that bench, take yourself a selfie in this day and age mm. and share it around and get people talking and engaging about their own town centres, like what we were saying, giving people a reason to go there and a reason to be proud of it and keep it going because we are seeing diminishing high streets, which is nothing unusual, but give people a reason to go, give people a reason to have pride in their towns, and that does that for me.
how long until somebody's put a road cone on top of his head? <laughs> <laughs> it's so long. A, but a road cone can, can be lifted back off again. Yeah, exactly. It's I mean, exactly. a local road cone and not a Chinese yeah. one. That's fine. Yeah, that's yeah. That's yeah. Made in a black country. A black yeah. country's own road cone. We're all in favour of that. Now, do you, either of you guys go to quizzes? Do you like a good quiz night? Yeah, I'm not brilliant. Films I'm pretty good at, but... It's the taking well, part, not the winning, stuff. isn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Like that. That's the team I, going. I usually get an answer come to mind, but it's usually wrong. For, the, for a different question. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. answer's right, it's the question <laughs> yeah. that's wrong. The, the question, question hasn't come up yet. <laughs> well, one of the region's most famous trivia nights, the Lord Mayor's Mega Quiz, it's called, in Birmingham, is making a return, and BBC Midlands presenter Sarah Falkland has been explaining to us why she's delighted to be getting, uh, shall we say, dressed up for the occasion. Well, we're launching the Great Quiz. It's one of the ways we raise money for my charities. So this is the launch, and hopefully, when the day comes, we'll, this place will be packed with people of all the clever devils. I don't think I'll be joining them. Look, at, I'll be mostly wandering around hass harassing them, but I don't think I'll be joining with some of the questions I've heard they ask. I think people get involved because, A, there's a lot of people out there that love charities, support charities, and want to get involved. Uh, since becoming the Lord Mayor of this city, one of the things I've realised is how many people are prepared to donate their time free of charge to help others out who are less fortunate and isn't that the way we should be? So tell me about the quiz, what can we uh, expect from the day? Well we have uh, ten rounds and we have an interval after five rounds. Everybody is going to be gathered in the Great Hall over there. Um, they all have like selection uh, buttons so that they can see very, very clearly how each of the teams are doing after each round. So it's kind of instantaneous almost. So the technology is there, they pick a button, make their choice on their answers and then the scores are up there. So it apparently gets very, very competitive. So you're the new quiz master this year, are you excited? about your role? Well I am because it's a legendary role not only do you get to dress up like this I don't think I have to wear this on the night but I'm following in some really famous footsteps I mean this quiz will be in its 28th year this year when I am quiz master and initially they had the likes of Magnus Magnusson and, and over the years they've had Chris Tarrant they've had uh, well my colleague Nick Owen um, in the hot seat reading the questions out so it, it is actually a real honour and to do it here in such a prestigious you know, building as the Great Hall at Birmingham University. Yeah, it's a real honour. Yeah. Just hope I have to read the questions very, very carefully because people take the quiz very, very seriously. There's a lot at stake. Well, I'm not sure if we've still got entries left for the teams to get. I don't know whether it's booked up or not, but if there's places, please, yeah, get your team in. Um, you know, all that practice in the pub quizzes is going to come in handy. Um, it's for a really, really good cause. It's for the Lord Mayor's charities. Um, amongst them are people like Fisher House, which is, of course, the purpose-built family home at, uh, at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital not far from here. So some really, really worthy causes. And it's a great night out for people to come and just, you know, exercise the grey matter and... Um, and have fun. I'd like to go, but looking at that, I'm not sure I've got anything in my wardrobe to, to wear. No. That sort of fits the occasion. Oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> you know, I, I think I'd probably go with one preset answer and hope that that came up somewhere because it's the embarrassment, isn't it, of having to put your hand up when you're the lowest scoring team? Or just go with the knockout fancy dress costume and yeah. get yeah. score zero, yeah. don't you think? Yeah. So, it looks yeah. like Harry Potter's convention, to be honest. So. Yeah, it does, yeah, it does, it does a like little. some kind of Hogwarts uh, <laughs> reunion, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, so, so interesting. But great, great they're keeping traditions going. Yeah, yeah it's going to a good cause as well. A fantastic of course. Sorry, and it yeah. is one of those things that you can play along with. I mean, some of the TV <coughs> quizzes that I'm watching nowadays, if I get one answer right, there's a celebratory run yeah. around the lounge, <laughs> yeah. punch in the air. But uh, you, you can get involved, isn't there? And that's yeah. the, the things that are maybe missing a little bit, going out to events like that and, and, and doing a quiz, whether it be in your local or in, in the town hall. Yeah. Now, a quick one just before we go into our first break. Yeah. Matt, you've been looking at the, this week's Black yeah. Country Bugle. There's a real heartwarming story here, isn't there? Yeah, there is, actually. There's a chap called Patrick Patrick Hayden who, uh, I think, 46 years ago, uh, sculpted uh, a crystal Madonna, uh, which was, uh, I think, donated to, to a church, uh, Harsbury Castle, actually, the chapel at Harsbury Castle. And he thought it would been lost or broken or, or, or damaged in some way. Uh, but it's kind of come back to him now, which is really heartwarming, actually, to kind of come full circle when he developed you know, sculpts this thing 46 years ago. It's now back with him. It's, I think it's still been put back in uh, the old palace in uh, in Worcester. I think it's gone back to. But uh, yeah, it's just great actually. It must be really nice for him having to 
see his thing, his baby, I suppose, come come back to him. Right? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's really a lovely awesome. story. And nice yeah. to see a really positive story on the front cover well, of the paper anyway. Yeah, true. That's they true. say yeah. local newspapers only put bad news on the front pages. Yeah. Yeah. The Backcountry Bugle proves things otherwise. Absolutely, they, yeah. So There's a picture of pa uh, Patrick and Doris, his wife, as well. So. Yeah. Uh, with the sculpture, so it's a great, brilliant. great, heartwarming tale made yeah. all the more remarkable by the fact that he obviously he thought years ago that he yeah, would see it, it again. Yeah, so, yeah. So absolutely yeah. fabulous. Nice, no, super. It's really good. excellent. Well, stick with us. After the break, we'll be back with more stories from the Big Centre TV news team and a look at what else has been going on in the local newspapers. And don't forget, anything you'd like to say, send us an email: the week at bigcentre.tv. Back in a moment. To the week. I'm still joined by Paul Shuttleworth and Matt Dredger. We're taking a look at the week's big news headlines. Let's turn our attention to food because that's something we've all got an interest in. People have long been travelling far and wide to Birmingham for a quality curry. But did you know that the city also now has an Italian eatery which has been voted the best in the country? The Big Centre news team were hungry to find out more details. Birmingham-based restaurant Cielo has been named the best Italian restaurant in England. For those who are after the five-star five dining experience, Cielo appears to be the place to be. The restaurant has been open on uh, September 2003, so it's 12 years. So what is the, the history of the restaurant and how has it developed since the opening? Well, the history of the restaurant is basically uh, two twin brothers, which is Costas and Chris Papa Cristoforo. They tried to get in a restaurant venture and uh, they believe in me, obviously, and uh, we start together, obviously not. This and course, they're very, uh, you know, they know quite well, you know, the food industry because they've been in Birmingham for many years, so they go a lot of, you know, takeaway places, so they know the food, what people like it. And uh, obviously we grew up together, you know, and uh, to achieve uh, now this big honour, you know. So it's evident that consumer satisfaction is at the heart of any good organisation. Um, so how do you always ensure that the consumer needs are always met here? Well, I mean, uh, the good belief of the boss is just uh, to work with the fresh food. And uh, we go good chef, which is uh, very good to put things together and get the best of the fresh food and the sauces. So the belief is to deliver good food, good service, uh, and you know, give a welcome to the customer and uh, that's what people like. Employees of the high-end Italian restaurant feel that this is a well-deserved achievement. I've been working in this uh, uh, company for uh, uh, three years by now. And how does it feel to be a part of the best restaurant? I'm very proud of it because uh, I'm part of this company and uh, as a part of this company I want the company to go growing all the time for all the best that we can wish for them to. Delighted customers are not only surprised that the award has gone to such an exquisite dining location. I like cello. Um, the food's great, the service is outstanding and they're also very, very flexible, particularly in the evenings when you can have a meal, then go to the theatre and then come back for your pudding. So you said that they're flexible. Do you find that the other restaurants within the area also um, are like this as well, or is it just cello that you particularly feel provide this service? I think Birmingham is particularly well provided for when it comes to good restaurants. But here in Brindley Place, cello is certainly my, my favourite one. Favourite both for me and for my children. General Manager of the Westside Business Improvement District spoke at the highly successful restaurant. Well, Cello is a long-established restaurant in Brindley Place, and it's a, it's almost like an anchor restaurant in in a, in a sense that it's it's well known. It's got a fantastic reputation. It's been around for simply years since since indeed since Brindley Place opened, and I've personally seen this place build its uh, its image up over the years. And what do you think it brings? You know what. What element do you think it brings to Brindley Place? I think that uh, cello brings you an authentic taste of Italy. There's a lot of Italian restaurants and I'm not knocking it, it's good food. I could take you to a fair few now. But what cello offers is authentic upmarket Italian dining. 
It's most certainly evident that Cello here in Birmingham have worked effectively as an organisation to reach one main goal, providing the best possible customer service to all of its consumers and remaining professional at all times. These are the contributing factors that has overall led to the massive achievement. This is Louisa Huggins based at Brindley Place, Birmingham for the Midlands. So another really good feather in Birmingham's cap there. I'm interested in, in, in your thoughts, gents, about how far would you travel to go and eat? You know, if somebody if somebody was saying, that's the best restaurant in the country, or that's the greatest, the biggest. The there are one or two personal favourites that I would drive 20 minutes, half an hour to go to because the service is just that bit better or the quality is that bit better and you can expect to pay that bit more. And I think it's really important as well, when you, a couple of times we've mentioned visiting towns and why to visit them. And restaurants is a great one because if you've got a good local chef sourcing local ingredients that cares about what's going into the food, you can really tell the difference. There are a lot of chains, cheap, there are a lot of chains churning out good quality, affordable food but there's also more and more venues now going that extra mile with local ingredients and caring about what they put on your plate that really give you a reason to go there and that's a great example of somewhere you can go for that special occasion if you want to spend a little bit more and visit somewhere that you may not normally visit I think the more of those restaurants we can get doing different things yeah. I think the problem at the moment is a lot of the chains have got a very like for like menu mm. and there's not a lot of choice and variety and if you can go somewhere yeah. for a really good curry or a really good Italian yeah. or you know you can go for rama or noodles whatever it is that you you'd like to try then having those good, passionate chefs makes a real difference for me. Would if so, if you saw a restaurant that said award-winning, would that yeah. make you want to go and visit it? Maybe, yeah, or would you yeah. prefer to make your own mind up about yeah, it? Yeah, I, I think it does help. Um, certainly to, to draw people into it. Certainly, but I'd much rather, as Paul's kind of alluding to, go to somewhere more local to me and support the local community. Really, mm. uh, especially if they're producing local product. But but you know that feature is brilliant because it's putting Birmingham on the map again. And mm. I think. Sometimes we're in the shadow of other regions, and I think it's just a really good another thing for to put a feather in our cap, really. You know, with the Grand Central opening recently and that type of thing. So. I mean, to, to summarise, you know, and to, to emphasise rather just how much there is going on. Interesting story in the Birmingham Post here this week, revealing that Birmingham attracted more visitors than ever before last year. Three million extra people headed into right. the city. Thirty-seven point two million visitors now came to Britain in the past. Uh, year and that's 10 percent more than any other city outside of london and when you put together all of the things that are going on things like christmas markets the new uh, air routes into birmingham airport yeah. different locally flavored developments like these well. restaurants yeah of course so, that's, yeah. A, that's another one isn't it it's yeah. interesting as well when you look at the the opening of john lewis at new street station it takes me back to the 80s when J john lewis was open at the top of corporation right, street yeah. and, and you had all those shops you had john lewis you had yeah. rackham's you had all the big department stores and now you've got Selfridges and the, and the new developments so suddenly you have got the best selection of shops we had a we had a resurgence sort of in the late 90s where we didn't have much better than any other smaller town whether you went to Sutton Goldfield or Warsaw you could get everything you need mm. suddenly Birmingham's got a bit more to offer now yeah. so that term of catching the train uptown to do that extra shop yeah. or getting something a bit special or a bit different or something you can't get in your local town mm. g gives you reason to visit those two yeah. places. And I yeah. think it, it keeps coming back to, doesn't it, having a reason to visit, whether it be Birmingham or Sutton Coalfield or wherever. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that resort world, £150 million pounds are spending on that, yeah. aren't they? These I mean, the Express and yeah, there, I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at the picture of it now. It's amazing, really. It's, uh, yeah, 12 storeys high building, and, uh, you know, it's the first of its kind in Europe, and it's got a casino, four-star hotel. It's going to have 50 outlet stores, restaurants, conference centre. So, yeah, again, it's just another pin in the mat for, you know, another feather in the cap, I suppose, for, for our region, really, because, Absolutely, you know, we've yeah. got the Grand Central now. We've got good news stories about, you know, the, the restaurants and so on. And this is perfect for you know, the NEC type of activity yeah. that goes on there with the conferences, supports Birmingham Airport as well. So these types of things around the Birmingham area and the Midlands area in general, just fantastic really. Mm -hmm. So no, it's really, really pleasing. Excellent. Uh, lots of good news. It's nice to yeah. talk about lots yeah, of it is good. stories. Really this really nice I, th I think as well, when you look at a development like that, that that's on the NEC complex, it's definitely a destination venue. It's somewhere yeah. you go. Mm. You know, if you're going to an event at the NEC, you can have a look around there. I, the last pop concert I went to, you know, you saw the development, thought, oh, you know, you could yeah. come in the middle of the afternoon and go over there mm. first and make more of a day of it. Yeah. I think there will be businesses that feel threatened by it. You know, if you, you're local 
local small business in, in, in Solihull or wherever that you think you might be impacted. But I think if it's managed right, you can also use places like that to promote those smaller local towns and places to Absolutely. go to. Yeah. You know, people visiting Stratford or Ironbridge for, for heritage, mm -hmm. as long as those new developments are promoting what else our area has to offer, sure. I think th there's something to be pegged on it, whereas it's seen to enhance and encourage visitors mm -hmm. rather than the elephant in the room that yeah. puts yeah. people off. As Carl said, it sounds like, you know, th the numbers are rising, it sounds like a destination point now as well, the Midlands yeah. area, so it yeah. can only be good for other businesses. Now how is this for a seamless link then, folks? Paul's talking about the NEC, big concert yeah. destination. I pulled this story out of the papers uh, on Thursday. It wasn't the NEC, but it was another big concert hall. Wolverhampton's Liam Payne has apologised to fans after One Direction. Know them? Heard of them? Yeah, I've heard uh, once or twice. twice were yeah. forced to cancel a gig at the last minute when he became ill. The, the, the big furore over this, this happened, happened at Belfast, is that all the fans had gone into the, into the auditorium, they'd paid for their merchandise, they'd had their drinks, they'd watched the support act, and only then did One Direction actually announce Sorry, Liam's ill here. It, it just leaves it left a nasty taste, didn't it, really? Yeah, but it's a bit of a poor show, really. Yeah. How many times have we been feeling not very well and thought, oh, I'm going to be all right for work, oh, I'll be all right, and then two hours later you think, this ain't getting any better. And for me, I think there would have an element of, oh, I don't feel great, but I think I'll be all right, mm. and then it gets to the stage where, hang on, you can't do this and of course they've had a member leave so mm -hmm. suddenly you've got that take that situation it's five four three up yeah and yeah. then having the confidence to carry that forward mm -hmm. I can see how something like that might happen I, I've had it where we've we've been at a concert or a venue or I've been working at one and they're like oh so and so hasn't turned up yet but they'll be here and you think, will they? And sometimes they are, and sometimes they aren't, particularly nightclub appearances and things like that. And I think y you've got a situation here where he's saying, oh, I think I'll be all right. And then, right, well, we need to make a decision by, and actually, maybe he's guilty of trying too long yeah. to do it rather than saying yeah, at 10 in the morning, I'm, I ain't gonna do this. Yeah, it could be, could be a case of that really, that he's just so passionate about going on stage that he might have I called it off at the last minute, but it's a shame for the fans. I, I think, think if anything, anything, it was know. more of a bit of a PR gaffe, wasn't it? That maybe yeah. some members of One Direction didn't at least go onto the stage yeah. and say, "Sorry, folks, yeah. nothing we can do. Yeah. We'll give you, you know, we're going to put another date on." It was the fact that they didn't even see them, and there was, you know, young girls in tears. And I, yeah. I don't doubt for a minute, Liam, you know, genuinely was ill and couldn't go on stage. I think if they had their time back again, they might. Might yeah, have done it just a little I think bit they probably should have called it off earlier. Uh, how, how, how you handle it and how you tell people, but mm. again, you know that that's the beauty of the live concert. You can get an artist who's on top of their game. You can get them not feeling great. Yeah. You can get great performances, mm. and you can get not so great performances mm. when you go and see an act. I mean, that takes me back to Madonna on the Brits doing this wonderful performance and ended up being. Head over heels, quite, unintentionally. Quite literally. Yeah. Well, we'll take a break now for the Big Centre news headlines, but when we come back, we'll find out a little bit more about Matt's Borough Club. <laughs> Welcome back to the week, where we're still taking a look at the big news headlines from around the region over the past seven days. Now, Matt, I said uh, at the start of the show that you were from an organisation called the Borough Club. Yeah. What's the Borrow Club? Um, Borrow Club is, uh, is a website where people can share their household items with other people in their community. Uh, and uh, the idea came to me, it was back in August of 2014, where I was getting ready for a car boot sale. Sigh. And, uh, <laughs> and I was creating the stuff, decluttering and getting rid of stuff that I wanted to get rid of at the car boot si sale. However, what I noticed was stuff that was in my garage, items that were in my garage that uh, I didn't want to get rid of, um, but I wasn't using that often. But just in case items? Yeah, you know, like a roof box or a tile cutter or a jet washer, that type of thing. And I just thought how wasteful it was, certainly from an environmental point of view, but equally a monetary point of view. Uh, and I thought it'd be great if there was a platform where you could put these items on there, um, charge somebody to use them, to borrow them, uh, and then you put whatever you want on there. What's happened now is that we, you know, we're one year old actually this month, so it's, it's great for us. Uh, but we've got people there posting stuff, not only that's from the garage, but from the wardrobe, from the shed, from the loft, from the kitchen, electronic items, all manner of items really. So it's really grown from that original idea in the garage and the, thankfully the car boot sale mm. and into into this website. Is it just for a geographical area around here or can, can anyone get involved? Well, anyone really. I mean, it'd be great if it was adopted 
UK wide, but certainly what I've tried to do is, is, is make it concentrated in the Midlands area really. The main reason for that is that it's, it needs to be a local platform because mm. you need the borrower, you need the lender, and they need to be very close to each other. Right. Let's say one or two mile radius, because you won't want to travel from, I don't know, Nottingham to Birmingham mm. to borrow a drill, that type of mm. thing. It's really got to be concentrated. And to be honest, the majority of our members are based within, if you like, the Birmingham, West Midlands areas. Mm. We've got a few that sprung up in, in Nottingham mm. and Reading and, and London. Uh, at the moment, but we're really focusing on the Midlands area just to grow that. What's the wackiest thing that's been borrowed so far? Then? The wackiest thing is the best story I've got actually, it's always the, the, the most pleasing story for me. We work with uh, partner charities as well, uh, so that they can actually uh, uh, ask their supporters, their staff, their volunteers to put stuff on the site and instead of the money going to the individual, they could donate it to the charity. Okay. So Age UK have put a pink gazebo uh, on the site and it's the gazebo they use for, for events but don't use it that often they admitted. Uh, so they put it on the site and that was borrowed three weeks ago by a lady that was hosting a baby shower for a friend of hers, obviously it was a girl, it was a pink yep. gazebo, um, but that was the great thing, it served a purpose for the lady that borrowed it, Linda, who you know hosted the baby shower for her friends. Meanwhile, Age UK get a donation to, to their good causes as well really, but that's the, the wackiest thing that's been borrowed so far. I mean, the, the thing that stands out for me with that is as well, when you're looking at events and you're looking at, you know, yeah. doing a fun day or one of these annual events where you need God knows how many gazebos or trestle tables, yeah. actually, if you can get together, even if it's, you know, almost like parish councils, yeah. sharing resources mm -hmm. would make a big impact on how successful events could be. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, it's for those types of items which you own, but you don't use that often that you have to put on the platform. And it's equally then for the people that want to gain access to those items, but don't necessarily want to pay the full price for it. So for example, one of our lenders made 70 pound in the space of three weeks from lending out four items mm. that would otherwise be sitting in the home doing nothing. Another family borrowed, uh, I think it was a roof box and a core box, and they saved 300 pounds by doing that, which was paying for their holiday in France. So it's really good stuff it's a win-win, isn't it? It's a win-win. It's one of those genuine stories where there isn't there isn't a downside for anybody that's involved in the yeah. whole. Yeah. What what about the the, the uh, split up between lenders and borrowers? Have you yeah. got more of one, less of another? Um, no, I mean it's pretty equal actually. I mean we've got quite a few members now within the region. Um, in terms of not all of committed items, if you like, to the site, um, but it's quite equal actually in terms of the people that have borrowed and the people that have lent stuff. But the benefit for me is although it's a website and it's all online and tech and all that type of stuff. It's all about the offline stuff that's brilliant actually because we also collect and deliver the items so we can actually meet the lender, oh, meet okay. the borrower. Oh. And I delivered uh, a jet washer to a chap that was cleaning his patio. So he borrowed it for just the weekend. So I delivered it on the Friday night, looked at his patio. It was quite a decent sized patio <laughs> and I went, you've got no chance mate, no chance. You're not going to do this over a weekend. I popped along on the Sunday night to go and collect it and he'd done it. He'd actually brilliant. done it. So I sat with him having a cup of tea on his, on his newly clean patio. And I said, you've done it. And he says, yeah. And he said, the reason why is that I had to hand the thing back. If I'd have bought this item, I'd have probably stopped halfway <laughs> Drank through. the job out. Had a cup of tea, watched the football, and not, wouldn't have happened at all, really. But he got it done within the, the You see, frame. that's always my excuse for not finishing the DIY around the yeah. house. Because I don't yeah. have to worry about it. I don't do it any time, can't yeah, I? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So, so I've got a shed full of half-done things. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the connection thing is great between the community. Mm. And, the, and that's where I think may, maybe tech has kind of driven a wedge through community mm. a little bit. And I see this as a piece of tech that's bringing mm. the community back together as well. So, so if people want to find out more about Borrow Club, yeah. how can they do it? Uh, go, go online to our website, it's probably the best thing to do, or look at our Facebook page, but if they just type in www.borrowclub.co.uk, no W in the borrow bit, they'll be able to see what it's all about really, and please you know, sign up and join, uh, post your items on the site, because we're getting searches from all over the country for all manner of things, mm -hmm. and if you follow us on Twitter and Facebook, we're constantly putting feeds out there to say somebody in Warsaw wants to borrow a an X. Yeah. That type of thing. Yeah, so uh, we're constantly putting messages it's out there. Fabulous idea. It, it's great for those those annual jobs, isn't it? Cleaning yeah. out your guttering or or you know scaring the slabs, scarifying your yeah. lawn yeah. or whatever it is that you need yeah. specialist equipment to do. But as you say, sometimes you use them less frequently than annually. You do, yeah, mm. and and absolutely, it's a good try before you buy service as well. So, for example, if you're going camping, or there's a GoPro on our site, and they're not cheap. They're about three or four hundred pounds. Yeah, yeah. But if you really want one. What you could do is actually borrow it from one of our members, mm. use it in the real world, I think it's £10 a day, use it in the real world, see if you like it. If you don't, you haven't wasted the three, £400. If you do, okay, you've paid a little bit more than you would if you bought it, 
but you've made an informed purchasing you've decision. Tested it, and yeah. camping is yeah. a great point of that. If yeah. you go to a camping trip and you bought the stuff, but then you don't like camping, yeah. what a waste of money. Yeah. You could actually borrow it from our people, our members, and then if you like it, great, go and buy your own if you wish to. Uh, but if not, then you haven't wasted hundreds of pounds on something you're not going to use that often. Excellent. Great community service. Talking of which, Thank you. I like, love this story this week about two local e electricians who were fitting a security system at the local Royal British Legion, and they thought, just another day's work. But the way in which they've actually helped the branch at Kings Winford has earned them a place on a shortlist for <coughs> a national award. Have a look at this. Meet Mark Dealey and Dean Wildblood, co-owners of a Dudley-based electrical company which has caused quite a spark and is now in the running to be crowned Britain's top tradesperson. It's nice to get sort of recognition for the, the hard work we've, we've been doing. Uh, we're just pride, basically. Yeah, it's nice to be nominated and uh, get this far. I just happened to be in the screw fix this year and saw the form. Thought I'd fill it in and see. Um, we had to put forward a reason why, and we just put down that we'd done the the work for the British Legion after they'd been broken into. Um, we mentioned that we do the work with Dudley College with their students and it just seemed to go from there. The competition, sponsored by Screwfix, will see Mark and Dean go head to head with four others. And if they don't get those wires crossed, they'll be heading to Wembley Stadium for next month's final. I was surprised. I didn't think anything had come through once I'd sent the, the form in originally. I didn't think we'd hear anything again, so I was quite surprised when we started getting calls and it seemed to steamroll from there. But then again, there's no reason why we shouldn't, you know, we're, we're as good as anyone out there. But for Mark and Dean, winning this award means much more than just getting a prize at the end of it all. Immensely proud. It would be good to show that, you know, we're from the area and, and yeah. that's how far we can go. And going up against, I know the, the guy who won last year was from Ireland, so... How was he? <laughs> it's not like it's, a, you know, just a small local competition, yeah. so would it be good to show that, obviously, this area have got good tradesmen? Yeah. Having beaten off thousands of tradespeople across the country to get this far, these electricians are hoping that the luck on their fuse isn't about to blow. This is Roshni Patel for the Midland in Kings Winford. We're not very good, us Brits, are we, at actually feeling comfortable about talking no. about how good we are? No. We don't do we need we need to learn from the Americans, don't we, yeah. really? Mm. We do play a lot of things down, don't we? Because they're doing a great job, that they're, they're good at what they do, and why shouldn't they get an award for it? It, it, it's a typical pride in the community, isn't it? So people yeah. who think they're just doing nothing remarkable and yet yeah. actually they're transforming people's lives and, and, yeah. and they're oblivious to it, aren't they? Sometimes? Absolutely, you know, a couple of local guys doing a great job and helping people out by the sounds of it on the way as well, so they deserve the recognition, really. And, and, and putting the region on the map, as we said, you know, yeah. if, if, if they yeah. don't enter, somebody else in another part of the country yeah. does. And if you get yourself a reputation of being a great area for tradespeople, yeah. You know, for electricians, for plumbers, whatever, then it, it, yeah. it, it starts to grow, it, it, it becomes organic, doesn't it? Yeah. It fosters yeah. itself, you know, yeah. so. Absolutely. So Absolutely. good luck to them in the final. That's what no, we yeah. yeah, good luck. Now, did either of you two do anything special on Wednesday this week? Wednesday. Back to I'm the future <laughs> day. <laughs> um, I didn't time travel, um, sadly. Uh, but no, I, I, there was loads of stuff posted. I mean, social networking was just full of pranks a bit of fun and it, it, it is a trilogy of films that I actually watch the first film came out was it about 84 was 84, it 84, 84 yeah. yeah and yeah. Sutton Coalfield Odeon and it's the only film that I came out of and went straight back in for the next show. It's the only film in my so life I've done that. to the future. I went back, back, back to, to Back to the back Future. To back to yeah. the future. Yeah. I see what you've done there. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, with wearing my other Big Centre TV hat on as host of the Brummywood Yammywood Film Show, yeah. I was down in London on Wednesday for the media premiere of Spectre, the new Bond film at Brilliant. the Odeon. Yeah. And across the way at the Empire, they got one of the DeLoreans wow. from the film. So I just, I just had to have my picture taken with it. I couldn't walk past it. Of course. So, so there it was on Facebook. But now, so it's October. The, the reason it was Back to the Future Day, of course, is October <coughs> the 21st, 2015, was the date that Marty McFly travelled forward to in, in the second film. And as you say, so many people have marked the occasion, but I don't think anyone's turned more heads than the team that descended on Walsall to film this particular spoof commercial.
great bit of opportunist marketing. Isn't it and brilliant? actually, the, the, the man who plays Christopher Lloyd in that footage is the owner of the DeLorean car, and right. that was his hair, I'm told. <laughs> wow, that's brilliant. It did look great, though, didn't it? Mm. And it's one of those things where you've just got to do something at the right time, and fair play to them for it's taking the opportunity. They, they, they don't yeah. sort of put their brand straight down your throat. It's there, but it's yeah. just, it's all about the stunt. It's all about marking the anniversary. And yeah. they, they filmed it just outside the Bescott Stadium in Warsaw, apparently, right. um, and, and gathered quite a, cl a crowd. As, as I can would, imagine it would, yourself. yeah. yeah. Well, it's all about quirky marketing as well, isn't it, really? Yeah. Especially in the social media age as well, because I'd imagine something like that would go viral. I don't know how many mm. f hits it's had on YouTube or Facebook or whatever, but and I can imagine it's done very well. And within the fan circles, that's going to go on and on and on. That's, yeah, yeah. that's not going to disappear, is it? Yeah, it'll stick in your mind. Actually. And it's nice, isn't it, that the Black Country's now got its own little chapter to the to the Back to the Future <laughs> yeah, story, yeah. really. Yeah. Uh, talking of um, Black Country stories, let me just take a little break from the news roundup now to give you a top leisure tip. This is the bit we call something for the weekend. And last Saturday, I was at the premiere of a Black Country-based film called Doreen. If you've not heard about this, it's a fabulous comedy about a benefits cheat who's been diagnosed with something called lazy cow syndrome. It's playing out to packed cinema audiences across the region, so if you are interested, get your tickets fast. You can find out more details on the website doreen.tv. Here's a taste of what the film has in store and look out for two or three cameo appearances from some familiar faces. It's the movie that the whole of the West Midlands has been waiting for. The heartwarming story of a hard-working family. You get working tax credit. Yeah. But that's for people who work. Have you got any experience in the manufacturing industries? No. What about general IT skills? No. I mean, working people shouldn't be getting benefits, should they? They should be able to support themselves, instead of sponging off the likes of us. Bookkeeping? No. Telesales? No. Word? PowerPoint? Working in a general office environment? No. Are you familiar with spreadsheets? Aye. Right. Do you speak any foreign languages? No. no. Have you ever done any commercial cleaning? No. Have you ever done any domestic cleaning? No. Have you ever done anything? No. Is your mother called Doreen? Doreen. The story of one woman's eternal struggle oh. against everything. Can I have my ball back, missus? I'll stick a knife through it next time. This is a movie full of surprises. You have the spit of some bloke off the telly. I get that all the time. A movie which asks all the hard questions. Would you care for a little bitumen slapped up your alley? A story of humanity. I think you're Miriam's ear door. Gun wheeler into the front room, Doris, because it keeps putting skid marks on this floor. A story which spans the generations. Put your ear in hiding, Miriam. A story of personal sacrifice. I'm in a Kumagura in Doris, and I take all the jobs. A thrilling adventure. Come on, why are you joining in? Because it's boring the <laughs> off me, mother. A movie which explores the unique bond between a mother and daughter. Mother, will you f off? From Flying Ducks Films comes a movie that speaks to the nation, even though most of the nation won't understand a single word. I ain't very really cakey neither. Am you cakey, Miriam? What is it? It's a cakey. Because this is a movie set in a land that time forgot. In the heart of the black country in England. Nowhere near Hollywood. Where are we, Jack? West Bromwich. It's the feel good movie event of the year. <laughs> which tests the human spirit to the limits of its endurance. Guardian of Warden on this. Doreen, the movie. I'm just off outside to shoot myself. It's just like a Hollywood comedy. Only funny. Black country kids on a black country street. Dreams in our heads, world in our feet. Friends for life, so it seems. Making our plans, living our dreams. One day we'll be famous. Movie stars with our Beverly Hills mansions and big flash cars. Not the most politically correct film that you'll see this year, but definitely one of the funniest. I describe it as, how do they say it? 
Boston Entertainment. Great, good fun. Now we've got a couple of minutes, gents, just to uh, follow that if we can. Um, just take a little look at some of the things that have grabbed our attention in the in the newspapers this week. What uh, have you got there? One of the things that I saw in the Birmingham Mail on Thursday was carers being told to get the flu jab. We've heard about people with diabetes and people at risk to get the flu jab. It's something that I have myself as a diabetic, but now they're advising carers get it because they're coming into contact with so many people in their day-to-day -day routine mm. that getting immunity to something that can be very serious is, is probably a good idea. And it's something I'd never thought of. It's a common sense thing, isn't it? Because mm. they're, they're, they're carriers, aren't they, as yeah. well? So uh, it can yeah. escalate massively, can't it? So yeah, good, a good news story here. I picked this one up out of the Express and Star. More than 300 Christmas jobs up for grabs at Merry Hill Shopping Centres. Next, Primark, Argus, various other stores are all recruiting. So this is the time when the job um, the jobless figures go haywire, isn't it? Yeah. Because people come off the yeah. dole yeah. And, and you don't quite know what's seasonal and what isn't. Yeah. But Sadly, yeah. they don't extend past January usually. No. no. But, no. But Although, it's a, a, to be fair, it's a good opportunity for people to show their worth if you do get one of those temporary jobs and you really throw things into it. You never know that you'll they'll be at the front of their minds if something more permanent does come up. Yeah, so. and, that, and these types of jobs all help with customer service experience as well. So, yeah. you know, getting a retail job puts you in touch with customers so that you can not only potentially apply for another retail job when that one comes to an end, but you could go to any 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 line of work because yeah. it's all about customer service. Absolutely, and, and good to know, you know, we talk about so much being done online, good to see yeah. that actual shopping centres Absolutely. are still expecting a rush of staff, yeah. so it's not just all being done from the, the comfort of our front rooms. Gents, yeah. time's got the better of us, I'm afraid. <laughs> thank you, Paul and Matt, thank you thank so you. much for, uh, for being involved. Um, and hope we've, uh, we've touched the story that you thought was an important headline this week. Don't forget, Bob Hall and the rest of the news team are with you every weekday, bringing you the latest headlines from across the Birmingham and Black Country region. We'll be back again on the week, same time next Friday. <laughs>